And the hard part that nobody ever talks about with brain injuries is you remember how you used to be able to think, but you can't. I spent like a good two years trying to like accept that. And with the motorcycle accident, I was like radical acceptance, like, all right, cool. I might lose my leg and I might be on crutches for the rest of my life. Fine, let's get to life, let's do this. Because I could think after the third injury in like three months, it really changed my personality because the places that I used to escape to were out of reach and there was nothing that I could do to get back to them. Today's creator is Renee Robin. After a horrific motorcycle accident that ended her modeling career, Renee spent six months learning how to walk again. During her recovery, Renee developed a passion for photography and compositing. Renee is now a renowned digital artist who travels the world teaching her passion. In today's episode, Renee will share her experiences as a freelancer, her thoughts on AI-generated art, and her journey through life-changing injuries that eventually led her to become one of today's top creators. Renee, I'm very excited to have you on. You may not know this, but I'm a big fan of your work. I love all the fantasy stuff that you create. I grew up playing video games myself. Final Fantasy VII was my game. Thank you so much for being on. It's really exciting to be with you. Well, likewise, I mean, I'm a gigantic fan of you, so this just all works out. So <laughs> I was super excited when you asked. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're on. Tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. I'm a Canadian photographer and digital artist, and I grew up in the prairies of Alberta, <laughs> which is not, not the most visually exciting place. <laughs> I got started in this industry from the modeling side, and then I got bored of that, and I switched over into the photography side. And so as of March 2023, it will be my 25th anniversary in this industry. That's amazing. Woo! Congratulations. Doesn't it feel weird? Because I now tell people... <laughs> I don't know what the actual number is. It's something like, I mean, here, I'll, I'll, I'm 40 years old. Like the first time I got paid to do something creative, I must have been like 18, 19. So theoretically speaking, I have 20 years of professional experience, which sounds insane right. to say. Yeah, well, I'm, I mean, I'm 38. So yeah, same thing. Yeah, it's wild to say that at 38, I've got 25 years of experience in something. Like, what? <laughs> it's insane. Well, I mean, that's why your work's so good. So, you know, it shows, right? <laughs> You know, I don't know how much the science will back this up, but at least in terms of motivation, I am uh, someone who would subscribe to the 10,000 hour rule that you need about 10,000 hours worth of effort to become good at something. It's true to a degree, and I think you definitely put in the work. I think that my debate on that is at 10,000 hours gets you to the point where you are consistent and you're reliable, but like where you actually start to really get good starts at 10,000 hours. Fair enough. I'll, I'll take that. Yeah. Now, you kind of like hopped over it. You mentioned that you were a model. <laughs> yeah. I was doing a little bit of reading about you, and, and I, I read that you had an, an accident that kind of helped you propel your career into photography, compositing, and all that. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So that basically is how like the switch really happened. I mean, I was 11 years into modeling, and I was kind of like bored and everything else and kind of over it. And I was just like, well, I wonder what else is out there. And I found, you know, I had a point and shoot camera and it had this little flower setting on it called macro, <laughs> but I didn't know what macro was. I was like, the oh, flower, was setting. flower setting. Yeah. Yeah. I can take pictures of flowers really close up. How cool is that? And, you know, so I started taking photos of macro stuff and I loved it. And I thought it was really fun and really refreshing, especially from like, you know, being tired of modeling. I was just like, if I see another photo of someone's face, I'm going to throw myself off a bridge. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't care anymore. <laughs> So anyways, but on top of that, I also build and ride motorbikes. Oh, that's and amazing. I was, riding, I was riding to work one day and I got hit and run over. Ouch. Yeah. When I stopped sliding, I took a deep breath in and out, you know, and my leg was crushed and everything. And it, it's funny. I mean, like all traumatic, uh, all traumatic events, the person that hit the ground wasn't the person they peeled off it, you know, half an hour later. But it was so funny. Like once I stopped sliding, I was just like. I guess this changes everything and just like massive personality switch happened right then and there. It was very weird. And uh, it did change everything. I mean, I was supposed to be walking fashion week in a few weeks, like, well, three weeks. And I was like, oh, do you think I'll be able to walk in three weeks? And the doctor's like, you're going to be lucky to keep your leg. Oh, my <laughs> <It's> like, God. Oh, <laughs> OK. You're going to have to learn how to walk again. Yeah. Oh, OK. <laughs> this is a lot more serious than I thought it was. So yeah, that was a, that was an experience. And then digital art started from there because at the time, I mean, this is pre flern pre-Creative Live. I mean, YouTube wasn't even really a thing. I think Calvin Hollywood had digital painting tutorials and there was like PSD toots, which were, they were like written word tutorial stuff. I remember them. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, I heard, I heard the whisperings of this word from like 
you know, video game developers that I knew about compositing. And I was like, well, what is that? And they're like, well, you kind of just like mix the, the two of them. And I was like, oh, you can mix the two of them. That's interesting because I'm stuck in this bed and I'm a very social person and I've never been stuck in a bed in a room in my life. And I was stuck in this thing for like six months, you know, you know like I would leave, I would get my, my daily outing to go to physio to try and figure out how to like work my foot again. <laughs> you know? And by the way, I'm smiling and laughing, not at the situation, only because I can <laughs> empathize. I've been through a similar situation <laughs> where you're in bed, you have to I go look it. talk to the physical therapist yeah. and all that sort of stuff. And it's resonating with me. So, so my smiles is it's not at your mishap is that, oh man, I went through the same. Yeah, well, you had a TIA as well. I had one in 2015. So I was like, when I saw what had happened with you, I was just like, oh, man, <laughs> like, that's, that's a hard road. But I mean, it looks like you've done a really good job on recovery. That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, it definitely took a lot of work. And a lot, I mean, I have an obsessive personality. So I just got obsessed with getting better, you know, and, and my obsession yeah. has was prior to that was work. Yeah. As far as I know, you've had three brain injuries or brain situations, correct? Concussions, yeah, concussions. And um, yeah, the last one was actually just uh, just over a year ago. We got My mom and I got T-boned in a car accident and woman blew a stop sign. And so, yeah, that was my third. Oh, my <laughs> third God. Brain stuff. <laughs> so... How does that affect your work? I mean, I'm sure it affects it your, your personal life, no yeah. doubt. As far as I understand, you're a freelancer. So how does that affect your clients? How does that affect the motivation to just keep working when you're having these medical situations? I, I can't, you I know, mean, like, starvation's a hell of a motivator. That's a good point. <laughs> that's a very good point. <laughs> Visa doesn't care. <laughs> Neither does my heating bill. <laughs> um, I think what it, especially the last one really taught me was how and when to start outsourcing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'd had a bunch of clients work that I had, I had shot and all of a sudden I was just like, I can't actually look at a screen. Like I'd never had a brain injury quite like that before, you know, where I had like, just looking at screens was like impossible for about three months. Right. And I was just like, I have work to do. Like, Oh my God, I have all this stuff to do. So I, you know, I started like finding retouchers and other companies that I could say like, okay, I need you to do this for me. Um, just so that the clients can get their work. And even if I take a cut on what I'm getting paid for it, at least the clients are getting the work that they've hired me for. A hundred percent. And I think it's very important. It's a lesson that also took me a while to, to get to where like, I don't have to do everything. You might be the best person for every single job. You might be the best person to wear every single hat, but that only means that something doesn't get done. So it's, it's something is better done 80% of the way there. Than not. And oftentimes that's, you know, just pure ego. Other people are going to do the work just as good, if not better. So, you know, you just yeah, have 100%. to get, get over it. So yeah. you and I are very similar in a lot of ways. We both <laughs> travel a lot. You probably travel more than me, but I found it very difficult for me to manage uh, deadlines, stress, all these different projects. Yeah. keeping in touch with my team. How do you manage that? Because it <laughs> seems like from the outside, it seems like you do it very successfully. Oh, man, I just drop a lot of balls. <laughs> I feel like from the inside, I just feel like I'm constantly letting someone down. <laughs> but anyways, yeah, I mean, it's just like a Rolodex of priorities. So I kind of try to control the chaos a little bit. But I also make sure that I travel with 12 terabytes of data, of, wow. you know, between client work and like background images that I might be needing and like everything just to like set out the fires of when the client calls and they're like, oh, you know, we really like this one. Can we get two more versions of it by tomorrow? And I'm like, I just landed in Amsterdam. Sure, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> I happen to have your files with me. So I travel with my client work um, for up to two years and they know that. And that's part of the reason why they hire me is that. Um, you know, they'll, they'll book me for the shoot and then they'll hire me for the retouching up to two years later. And so then, you know, that's one way I found that I kind of try to control the chaos as opposed to having to be, you know, oh my God, can we do this shoot like every single quarter? I'm like, well, let's do one shoot a year and then I will have all that information with me. And then as you need it throughout the year, I'll do the retouching as it's needed. That's something that a lot of people don't think about, all this extra effort that goes into being a freelancer and having these relationships with these clients that, sure, people may see your beautiful photo online, your beautiful composite, but they don't realize, oh, yeah, Renee's traveling with, I'm assuming, 50 pounds worth of equipment everywhere she goes. Everywhere, yeah. Yeah, my backpack, my backpack pre to getting injured a year ago anyways was between like 40 and 60 pounds on Jesus. average. Jesus. 
and this is what <laughs> why I wanted to ask you this question. I'm completely the opposite. I'm terrible with traveling with equipment. I don't even travel mm-hmm. with my Wacom tablet just because it, I just can't. You know, I try to travel <laughs> as light as possible, but then I get into these situations where I'm like, oh my god, I'm in you know Vegas or whatever, and I can't work because I don't have my stuff, and and then that creates extra stress when I get home, and now I'm working all night. Yeah, yeah, I hate that. I'd rather carry the weight and just know that okay. You know, these meetings today, I have to get these done and I'm going to go back to my hotel room tonight and just like punch these out and then go to bed. Right. And then, you know, it's basically traveling with a little fire with me all the time so that I can put out bigger fires (laughs) or maybe maybe. Yeah. Fire extinguisher. I'm traveling with a little fire extinguisher. (laughs) We kind of know each other, but not really. I don't even know how we became Facebook friends. Probably a trade show. Probably Lisa Carney. Probably. And and that's what I was going to say. I, I only remember meeting you one time in person. And that was just before the world ended. That was January 2020. And I remember being yeah. in, I believe it was a Mirage at a bar. And I and you said hello to me. And yes, we right. had <laughs> we had a conversation that was very, very short. Yeah. Is weird because I feel like I know you, but I really don't know you. You know what I mean? The internet makes that sensation very strange. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I have some assumptions and I don't know if they're right or wrong. So I'm just going to ask the question. <laughs> Let's hear it. I want to hear these assumptions. <laughs> you work with some huge clients. Um, you know, you can name them if you want. I know Adobe's a client. I know you work with many, many different huge clients. And how do you handle a situation where you pour your soul into a project but then you have to distance yourself from it and not get to att- attach because somebody might say, you know what, this is not a good idea. Or, you know what, I don't like it. We're going to have to change this. How do you handle that as an artist and also as a professional? I mean, this is going to sound really weird, but I just don't pour my soul into it. <laughs> I acknowledge, enough. especially on like big commercial shoots, I'm a cog in a wheel and I'm a service provider. I'm basically like the waitress of pixels, right? Love and if it. my client wants more chicken, <laughs> on their pixels <laughs> than I originally had brought out, then I will go back and get more chicken to put on their pixels. <laughs> Perfect. That You know what? And I was actually fishing for that answer because it's difficult being public to a degree online in the sense that people will always criticize your work. And a lot of mm. the times it's work that they see because somebody paid you to do that type of work, which meant that there was more than one chef in the kitchen. And they'll say, you know what? I don't like that. This should have been like that. And my answer usually is, yeah, I agree with you, but that's not what the client wanted. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I think that's one of the realities of of, um, that people don't understand if they're not yet in the creative industry and and want to get into it, that a lot of the times, most of this stuff is stuff that you probably would have done different if you had the final say. But as as you say, you are just the chef. And if they want more pixel chickens, then that's what they get. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I... I just don't take it personally. I mean, sometimes it'll like frustrate me, but depending on what the campaign is, I kind of like it when someone else is the art director. Just like, tell me what you want. I will make this happen for you. Right. Oh, you want to change it up? Cool. This is my hourly rate. You, we can change this as long as you want. You write that check. We're good. You know what? That's <laughs> how I feel. I Not that I rather, but if the professional relationship is, I'm going to pay you to you to, for you to complete this design it's a lot easier for me if you tell me exactly what you want and it'll get done. You know what I mean? 100%. Yeah. It's super easy. But yeah. it's a completely different situation if you're creating work for yourself. And that's actually something I wanted to talk to you about. I, You know, you have a lot of great work online and some of the stuff that you do post online is, is, is professional. Like, uh, I'm just going to call you whenever I need an ego boost. <laughs> <laughs> Is it say nice things to me? I'm feeling bad about work today. <laughs> I have no problem with that. No, but I, what I wanted to ask you is how do you develop your ideas? Um, you know, when you're sitting at night, you know, laying in bed or whatever, I'm sure that there's there's a little spark. How does it go from that one spark to here, a year, a month, whatever later, until it becomes an actual project? How does the inspiration process and in, in making it into a reality happen for you? Oh my God, all the ways, every way. All of them. There isn't really like one streamlined way other than the most common. My best ideas come when I'm dreaming. Mm -hmm. So that means I have to get enough sleep to get to REM sleep, which is sometimes hard to find. (laughs) (laughs) How do you manage to do it on the road? That's my question. And drugs. (laughs) (laughs) Pharmaceuticals. Fair enough. Yeah, I'm just like, put me down for eight hours. Let's go. (laughs) And that's interesting because most of your, your work at least the way that I see it, and please correct me if I'm wrong, it feels like I'm reading a fantasy novel. 
or maybe playing a yeah. video game. So it's interesting that you say dreaming. I did too much of both. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, you know, talking about fantasy novels, your work is very reminiscent of Frank Francetta. Used to do comic book and fantasy death book dealer. covers back in the day. Unfortunately, passed away in 2010 of I a stroke. I have a death dealer book here. Actually. Oh, you do? One of my good friends uh, worked with Frank for years and wrote the Death Dealer series with him. And he actually lives here in Edmonton, which makes no sense to me wow. whatsoever. But well, I'm you live in Edmonton. He does. I do. Yeah. Which is like normally a horrible thing to say, but I've got these like amazing people here. So that part's pretty great. <laughs> yeah. Again, it's interesting that what sparks creativity is dreaming and your output seems very fantasy, yeah. dreamlike to a degree. So I think it's pretty cool. Well, when I was young, I had no idea who Frank was, Frank Frazetta was. Mm -hmm. And then as I got into photography, a bunch of people were saying like, oh man, your work's really like Frank Frazetta, Frank Frazetta, Frank Frazetta. And I was like, I don't know who this dude is. Like, <laughs> I know who Brahm is. I know who Louis Rio is. But like, you know, I'd never heard his last name. And then people started showing me as I finally, well, I looked it up. And I was like, oh, that guy. I love that dude's work. <laughs> He's amazing. Um, so it was very like a subconscious uh, influence, I think. But also, I mean, I found these photos. If I had been pre-planning on this, I would have brought them and packed them. But I found these, this photo album when I was six years old. Mm -hmm. And I had cut out my cat. And, mm. you know, he, I had taken a photo of him, like, jumping off the bunk bed. Because, you know, we had a farmhouse, right? So you know, there's cats and dogs and horses and everything else there. But he was jumping off the bunk bed. And I cut him out and I put him in like I pasted him as if he was jumping into the fish tank and so it was like early compositing that mm -hmm. I didn't even know without Photoshop. people were just you know were, yeah it's so like analog people compositing. always ask totally yeah like vintage and people always ask like you know how did you get into compositing and I, and I always thought that I mean I started in Photoshop 7 not like CS7 but Photoshop 7 me too like same one yeah yeah and so you know I started with that making fonts and stuff like that but then I didn't apply it to photography till years later and I, you know, all of a sudden realized when I found this photo album, when I moved, I was like, I've always been thinking about compositing. I just didn't know what it was. I'd always been looking at the world, not for what it was, but for what it could be. And compositing has definitely made that possible. You know, it makes me get out of wherever I am and I can bring the world from here, like out into something that's real. I don't, how long were you in bed after your accident? Uh, it took me six months to learn how to walk again. Oh my God. I can't even so, imagine. I mean, it took me a month and a half, so nothing compared to <laughs> two years. So, still long. Yeah, I mean, still. But I had my, uh, you know, brain thing, my stroke during COVID. So I couldn't have any visitors. So I was in the hospital for, you know, close to a week by myself. And all I kept thinking about mm -hmm. was just work. I just remember thinking, oh, my God, what am I going to do if, if my body doesn't work anymore? What if I can't walk anymore? You know, like, what am I going to do? And one of the funniest things I now funny looking back at it is I was laying in bed. <laughs> and I remember thinking, okay, I'm going to try to do a composite in my head. And then like, in my head, I was trying to figure out where all the menus and stuff were, and if I could still put things together in my head. <laughs> Obviously, I couldn't check myself to see if I had done it right. But in my mind, I was like, okay, I can still do it. I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. The reason I'm telling you this story is, was there anything like that when you were in the hospital that you were like, okay, I'm going to, this is my plan or this is, let me make sure that I'm okay to proceed on, on my passion, which at the time might have not been compositing, but maybe photography. Not so much the first time, but in 2015, when I had the, the other brain injury, I mean, so there were three in a row in like a very short sequence of time. And the second one was the TIA. And um, that was scary because I lost like my close up vision. Um, but what was interesting is so if you look at my work pre 2015, it's very desaturated and very gray. Um, and that's because, you know, those hue awareness tests that you mm -hmm. can do? Yeah. I only ever got like 75% ever. I just like couldn't previous. see colors. Yeah. And then so I'm in Seattle at Creative Live and I still don't have my close up vision yet. <laughs> Oh, wow. It wasn't back yet. I didn't tell them until after I was done the presentation. I was like, I just had a stroke. Oh, my ago. God. <laughs> but, um, you know, it was for photo week and it was my first time and I was super excited. And I was like, you know, oh, my God. What was so interesting is I was in the, ho the hotel across the street and I was looking at everything and I was looking at everything and I was like, why does everything look different? I don't understand why everything looks different. Everything looks the same, but everything looks different. And all of a sudden I realized, I was like, oh, the leaves are different shades of green. Oh, my God. I'd, 
I had no idea. I just thought green was green. There was like three shades of green and that was it. And I'm looking at the tiles in the hotel and I'm realizing, I was like, can I see color better? <laughs> what is happening? Like, I can only sit up for four hours a day and then I have to lay down again. But am I seeing color better? And I just, I ran up to my hotel room. I did the hue, hue awareness test and I got 100% and I was, I just about dropped my laptop. I was like, what is wow. happening right now? And so I had to reteach myself color theory because I could suddenly see color and I could see all of the colors. And I was just like, did I just get a benefit <laughs> from frying my brain? <laughs> I was like, I still can only sit up for four hours at a shot, but I can see color. I was like, weird. And so, yeah, I had to, I had to really consciously uh, study color. And you know James Gurney? No, I don't. Oh, he's this amazing photorealistic painter. He has the most incredible book called Color and Light. And I just devoured the book, like cover to cover, like four or five times just to make sure that I understood color theory because all of a sudden I could see it. Because before people were explaining color theory to me and I was like, I don't get it. Like, I don't, because, because I just couldn't see it. It was very weird. <laughs> so when you look back at your early work, can you think about like, oh, you know what? If I would have used these complementary colors, things would have been better. You're like, no, never mind. That's in the past. And now it's so, this is my new talent now. In 2017, 2018, something like that, I did a I did a rebrand and I went back and I re-edited like 300 images. And, you know, some of them made it onto the website. A bunch of them didn't where I was just like, nope, this image is still crap. <laughs> it's just still old. <laughs> No matter how much I increase that saturation or that vibrance, it's still <laughs> still just a bad photo. <laughs> it's crazy to hear you talk about those numbers because you have so much work and it's a lot of good work. Like, where do you find the time? Because I know how long post-processing takes and I've seen some of your work and I'm like, all right, that's at least 20 hours, you know, and like <laughs> then I see like 30 others and I'm like, oh, my God, like, where, does, where do you find all this time? Uh, I'm really selfish. Mm basically what that boils down to um you know so i prioritize my client work obviously mm -hmm. but even more so i prioritize my personal work even though i never really have enough time because of the client work to do the quality of work i would like to do on my personal stuff like i would love to be able to spend like two three four days working on an image i just don't have time right, right? and that is the one thing that I tell people when they're first getting into this and you're like, oh, how do I, you know, I want to turn this thing that I love into a job. And I'm like, man, do it because you love it for as long as possible. Because as soon as this becomes your career, it changes the game. Yeah. And I mean, the purest way to, pr to pursue art is just because we love it. And that's so important. And I really think that artists should not skip that step. I mean, you know, in the middle of my career, especially when things were super crazy busy, um, I stopped prioritizing personal work and I would just burn out and burn out and burn out and burn yeah. out. And then I was just like, nope, stop this. I was just like, if I am making less money, but I'm creating the work that I want to create and I'm getting sleep, awesome. You know, <laughs> um, it was just wasn't worth crushing myself into the ground anymore. I mean, especially post brain injuries that just couldn't anymore anyways. I had to sleep. Definitely. Yeah. And that's actually something that was recommended by my neurologist that I needed to sleep more and I had no problem going to bed at 2 a.m., you know, working late and then waking up 8 and then continue to work. I was perfectly fine. And now I have to find that extra time to sleep just because I don't to. want something to happen or just not be able to cognitively be aware <laughs> during the day. I had never had, up until 2015, I'd never had an injury that took away my my inner garden, I guess is the worst cliche word to use ever, but I'd never had an injury that took away my ability to think in the way that that did. And it never really had, it never did, it never did come back. Um, the way to pre injury anyways, you know, it came back like 85, 90%, which is pretty good considering, you know, what the injuries were, but it was never hundred percent. And the hard part that nobody ever talks about with brain injuries is you remember how you used to be able to think, but you can't. And that's a really, like, I, I spent like a good two years trying to like accept that, you know, which is, you know, with the motorcycle accident, I was like radical acceptance, like, all right, cool. I might lose my leg and I might be on crutches for the rest of my life. Fine. Let's get to life. Let's do this because I could think, right. You know, and I, like that was there. And then in 2015, especially after the third injury in like three months, it really changed my personality because the places that I used to escape to were out of reach and there was nothing that I could do to get back to them. And especially, you know, in 2015, the, there was not enough, in, uh, 
what's the word I'm looking for? This happens a lot now, especially in the last year. Um, <laughs> the, uh, nope, this is happening right now. Hold on one second. I apologize. <laughs> I'm the same way. Oh, man. This is why the podcast is edited because Jesus <laughs> might forget a word or two. Oh, it's, it's fine if people see this because this is the reality of a head injury. Um, uh, but, um, oh my God, this is happening. I'm turning red right now because it's embarrassing sometimes. But, Don't worry, uh, we'll bring the saturation down. Nobody will be able to tell. <laughs> just you adjust me a little bit. Yeah, just thanks. a little bit. Don't worry. We'll get uh, <laughs> our editors to color correct you. You'll look flawless. Oh man, it's so bad. I'm sorry to everyone who's listening. That's okay. <laughs> well, how about this? If you remember your point, feel free to stop what we're talking about and say, hey, you know what? This is my point. It might, it might come back. <laughs> Something that I, I learned about you was uh, something very interesting about three kittens in your family farm and how you had a white one named Sprite and how Sprite eventually helped you get new meaning for photography and capturing moments. And, and that's really what the question is about. Uh, I want you to tell us a little bit about Sprite, but more importantly, how Sprite helped you create that appreciation for capturing moments, which is something I'm trying to get back into. Yeah, I mean, uh, Sprite was my dear little doom floof. She was the earless wonder. <laughs> she <laughs> lost her ears to frostbite, and my dad finally retired her off the farm, and he was just like, this is the only cat that's ever lived long enough. I mean, they usually get eaten by coyotes or hawks or something. I mean, it's farm cat life, unfortunately. But, um, you know, these cats have jobs, <laughs> and their jobs are to kill the rats and vermin. Anyways, um, this little cat had lived when we did not think she was going to, she was a little dumb. She was white. <laughs> Half the year she is hawk food and somehow she avoided it all. So my dad called me up and that was actually the same year that I had the brain injury. So I was really suffering um, and I really needed a way out of that. And so my dad was just like, here's responsibility, an aging cat. <laughs> 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 and so, you know, this, this little cat was my, my therapy and, you know, she was so grateful to be living inside. I mean, she was she liked being outside because she just loves, she's a cat, she's a predator. She loves to kill things. Right. And uh, she was a very good mouser. <laughs> and so, you know, I have this cat in my house and I'm, you know, healing from a brain injury and, you know, the depression and everything else that comes along with it, you know, when your brain chemistry is just that out of whack. And, uh, you know, I started looking around and, was, you know, this, this little cat's not going to be around for forever. You know, she's, she was 17 at the time and I have no idea how long, especially at that age for cats. Is it going to be a month? Is it going to be a year? Is it going to be, you know, it wound up being like two and a half years. So she lived like to almost 20 years old. And I gave that cat the best retirement I possibly could. But I, I realized that like I wasn't, these moments mattered. You know, this little cat had a profound impact on me, you know, from, from a child from when I was 13 you know, and then like, I always make time to see her when I go out to the farm to my dad's and everything. And, you know, here she was, she was like my little service animal of being like, Hey, you got to get up and you got to get out of bed. Cause I'm hungry. <laughs> you know, cause even if I couldn't get up, out of bed to feed myself, I would get up to feed the cat. And if I got up, if I could get myself out of bed to feed the cat, then I could probably have a shower, which means I could probably feed myself. Right. And so there's these little moments between this cat and I were really important. And I realized that you know, I can document this on my phone all day long, but I've got $10,000 in camera equipment here that I've spent over the years. And, you know, why don't I actually document this stuff? You know, mm -hmm. these little tiny moments of her sleeping in the sunbeam with her little, I mean, I used to joke that she looked like a tiny falcor because she had no ears. <laughs> 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 you know, my favorite, my favorite thing was like her resting bitch face. You know, she just looked angry all the time, even though she was so sweet. She just had that face, you know, she had the face of a villain. <laughs> And, you know, documenting those little moments became really, really important. And I love those photos. You know, those photos are so important to me. And even on to, up until the day that um, ultimately I had to put her down, you know, I had two photographer friends come over and I had one of them, I had him photograph nice photos of, of Sprite and myself, you know, just it, even though I did not look good, I was tears and puffy eyed and everything. But, you know, just to have some nice photos of her that I hadn't taken and then I had another friend come over who's a journalist and I had, you know, it's a journalism experience and everything. And I was just like, hey, man, I need you to photograph this how it actually is, wow. because I'm going to regret this decision. I'm going to question whether I made the right choices or not. I need you to document this for what it actually is. I need you to photograph the ugly without making it look uglier. I just need you to photograph the truth. 
And so he was there and he was photographing when she was having seizures and stuff like that. And so like, I still have like those photos mean so much to me, like mm -hmm. even yeah. now, <laughs> you know, it's been like five and a half years and I still think about those images and they're so important to me because that little cat had such an impact on me. And that was really how I started reconnecting with like why photography is actually important outside of it being just a commercial thing of like, this is how I, you know, feed myself and this is how I, all these things. And I'm like, but photography at the end of the day, you know, is about documenting our lives and, you know, whether we choose to print them or not, you know, we have these skills. Why don't we use them with the people closest to us? You know, why are we only ever giving them away to the companies and the corporations, which is great. And I'm grateful for those opportunities. But why are we only ever using it there? We don't have a lot of time. And there's a couple things that I still want to get to. You know, you're talking about having these skills. What do you think it takes to become a professional creative, in your case, a freelancer, if you want to use that word. I don't know how many slashes after your name you're going to have if you're a, you know, compositor, photographer, whatever. <laughs> like, what you, you yeah. define what that means, but what does it take to get to that level, you think? I mean, so I get asked this question a lot right now, and really the biggest game changer that hasn't had time to mature yet is AI art. Mm -hmm. And so the reality is that I don't actually know anymore. Mm, because... Very good answer. Everything is changing. Like AI art, I figured I had another two years left before I'd really have to think about like, okay, now what, right? I mean, I'm already losing like a number of, like a lot of clients to really? just AI art. Oh yeah, 100%. I mean, none of the big corporate. What, what I mean, were they hiring a lot to of do? The, like album art, book cover art, things like that. It's the shrapnel work. You know, it's the $500 to $1,000 jobs that are like, you know, it's, it's filler work. But the filler work just like overnight just disappeared. And it's wild. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, I mean, people who are professionals in the industry are going like, okay, you know, who have 30, 40 years experience are having the same questions of like, what's actually next? Mm -hmm. And the technology and the, the legal side of it all has to mature. But it, it happened way faster than I thought it would. And I mean, on one side, I think it's so funny because people say like, oh, the art lacks soul and everything else. And I'm like, yeah, sometimes it does. And sometimes it's a direct ripoff of, of, of existing artists and you just hire the artist. But there's some artwork that's getting put out there, you know, and I use the word loosely, but, you know, collections of pixels, whatever. That's actually really thought provoking work that people were not making mm -hmm. and they weren't making on that level. And it's actually super compelling. You know, some of it, they're like, like with everything, with all art, with all photography without everything there's a percentage of it where you're just like that's very cool i mean it's it's inspiring and terrifying all at the same time because there are things that these programs can make that obviously can make it faster and obviously can make it better than i can do and i'm totally fine with admitting that <laughs> and but like it's but it's on some side the other side it's so inspiring because it's like wow those are ideas that like you know people just hadn't really thought of before and you know, I really wonder how that's going to fuel the creative industry, you know, how it's going to influence fashion, how it's going to influence design of cars, how it's going to inf influence architectural design, because it's going to. And that's amazing. But what does it mean for professionals? I don't even have an answer for that right now. Like, I feel like it's, you know, I had, I thought I had two more years of thinking on it before. And then just mid journey four came out and I was like, damn. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, there's a lot of crap out there and there's a lot of bad art out there, but there's every now and then I find a piece where I'm just like, I've never seen a person make that. That's very cool. <laughs> and that probably took three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> On a slow computer. Yeah, right. Exactly. Right. Like it's insane. So it really does change the conversation of like, what do you want to do if you want to do this professionally? Um, you know, experienced pros with many more years of experience than me are asking themselves the exact same question right now. This is like a huge shift and i'm excited and terrified all at the same time of just like what does this actually mean what do you think your next move will be i don't even know <laughs> if i knew it i'd already be going there you know i i i'm on one hand i i'm never an early adopter i'm mm. really guilty of that i'm i'm very slow i like to sit back and like sniff the air and like kind of you know observe from the outside for a little while before I finally start dipping my toes in but it's a big shift and it's happening to so many industries simultaneously you know it's it's very disruptive and it's very you know um yeah I don't know it's it's 
people smarter than me have had far more compelling conversations about it. But <laughs> I just think that you mentioned it, right? Things things are changing. They're definitely going to change. I agree with your comment about I thought I had a little more time before this really became a thing, but it's now a thing yeah. like today. Like it's as we sit here, it's a thing. Yeah. Yeah. When Mid Journey 5 comes out, like what the hell? Yeah. You know, right? And I'm not necessarily worried at the like, maybe I should be. I don't know. Maybe I'm just naive, but I've always had <laughs> that, <laughs> that mentality of like, all right, whatever it is, I'll figure it out. Right. Yeah. I also sit in a very privileged position of saying, well, I got my training business. I got my, you know, compositing. I got like, you know, different pots in, uh, in different places. So it's, you know, if one dries out, then there's still a few others. So maybe I am saying this with, with that, you know, quote unquote privilege. But I've always been the kind of person who looked at things as an opportunity. I'm with you mm -hmm. that I don't know what my next move is when speaking about AI art, but I do see it as an opportunity and it's just something that I'm going to have to figure out. And I wish I could give you an answer as, as to how I'm going to use it or, 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 or what I will do with it, but I do see it as an opportunity. Not scared yet. Maybe I should be. I don't know. At the end of the day... No matter what, the really good artists are always going to rise to the top. Just because digital photography came out, analog film, lots of people still make a living on analog yeah. film. How? I don't know how, but they're doing it. Um, you know, painters who paint with oils, you know, they're still making, there's still artists out there who are making a living at it. So I think there is always going to be space for excellence. I agree. And so as a result, I want to make sure that I also, I'm not discouraging people from exploring a new career or hobby in the arts because the reality is, is that we have no idea where the next absolutely mind-boggling artist is going to come from right I mean I got into composite photography because one of my friends who worked at Bioware told me about blending modes and I was like excuse me <laughs> <laughs> and that changed my entire life right one conversation right and so I want I really hope that this doesn't discourage anybody. I mean, so at the end of the day also, I'm not afraid to tell everyone, don't get a career in the arts. Because I know for a fact that for the right person out there, they don't care if I tell them no, they're doing it. Because that people told me no. People told me no all the time. They're like, don't go into photography, it's failing, it's this, it's that. Digital's ruining everything. Oh my God, like the woe is me. And so we're having that conversation again with AI artwork. Um, granted, this changes the game a lot different more significant way than just digital to film but i do think that for the right brain out there people telling them like no you shouldn't do this they're just not going to care they're going to do it anyways sure. and so i really hope that it's the people who are just underneath that where someone who is really capable of excellence is dissuaded by someone saying well i bet ai can do it faster so why are you bothering right it's those people that are the ones that I worry about where I'm just like, yeah, but you're right there. And there's millions of people all over this planet who are not living up to their potential. That is the human thing. <laughs> when we're all guilty of that. I could be 100%. better at paperwork looking at the side of my desk. I'm not. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I really want people to, to really hold on to that inspiration. I completely agree. I always tell people that I'm always, I've always been Again, terrified, but also super excited to be expired as an artist. Yeah. Because that means that there's people out there. Because, I mean, when I came up, I took a bunch of jobs from people mm -hmm. who, like, I took their jobs. I yeah. took their, I took, because I could do something different that they were looking, that their company was looking for. Sure. And now since then, other people have come along and, like, they take my jobs. But I think that's, like, obviously on top of just how it works, I think it's so exciting. Because... I'm so interested in what people are making, yeah. you know, and that's very exciting for me at the same time. It's terrifying because I got to eat. <laughs> <laughs> something that I think is very important and something that I think needs to get talked about more because um, people who put themselves out there, especially people like you, Renee, as I understand it, you've received um, some harassment online. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know yeah. if it's the subject matter. I mean, some of your work, in my opinion, is there's nothing wrong with it, but it can be, if you want to use the word provocative. Provocative? Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know if it's the fact that you are a woman, but as I understand it, you got less when people thought you were a man. 100%. Oh, yeah. There's no question. And it started coming out that I was a woman because I was trying to shed that I had like a modeling past. So I just didn't share photos of me. I wanted people to search photography, not, you know, photos of like my old modeling career. And 
it was super funny when I started coming out as a woman. Man, they hate me. I got like freaking death threats. And I was like, guys, this is digital art. Like, who cares? Like, who cares? I'm not hurting animals. Like, it's literally, <laughs> it's pixels. It's the most throwaway. Like, this is like, you know, my partner has this really great analogy of like, you know, this is the peak of the triangle of hierarchy of needs. And we're like leaping off the top to find meaning. Yeah. <laughs> and that's really what it feels like whenever you're giving hate mail to an artist because you don't like that they photograph butts and you're just like, oh my God, <laughs> is this happening? I'm online and I get stuff too. Um, I imagine that if I were a woman, I would get X amount more than what I currently Possibly. do. Possibly. Yeah. Probably. Who knows, right? It but gets, well, so the difference that I find is that it's, it's the language of it changed. So when people thought I was a guy, I would get like hate mail of like, you know, go back to art school. And I was just like, yeah, whatever. I don't care. Right, right. <laughs> but then when I started coming out, there was a woman, like we're getting death threats and like people sending me like my home address and like the address of my parents and stuff like that. And I was just like, what is going on? That's like insane. it definitely got a lot more personal. Um, whereas when people thought I was a dude, they were just like, you suck. And it was just the chest thumpy gorilla, yeah, right. and, you know, that stuff, which is whatever. I don't care. You can say it, whatever And you just want. to be clear, it's not like you were pretending to be a man. People just assumed that you were yeah, a man. It's just assumed. Yeah. I mean, I met people in WPPI who are friends now. And the first time I meet them, I shake their hand and like, oh, I'm Renee. And they're like, Renee Robin? And I was like, yeah, what's up? Like, I'm so sorry. I thought you were a guy. <laughs> Or, I mean, that was when I started being like, oh, I guess I should post photos of me right. a little more often. Because, I mean, I started, I would show up for jobs, for meetings with clients, like potential commercial clients. And I would show up and be like, hey, how's it going? Nice to meet everyone, sit down. And they would just be waiting. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, so are we waiting for someone? Like, oh, we're just waiting for the photographer. And I'm like, sup, that's me. And they're just like, oh, my God, we thought you were the assistant. Oh, my God. <laughs> I hope you got and the job. Started, <laughs> I did. Yeah. <laughs> they had to I, at that point. <laughs> At that point, yeah, it was bad. It was looking bad. But I mean, it's, it happened enough times that I was just like, okay, I still have to start putting myself out there. And it, so it's it's been happening on my Instagram again. So I just crossed like 30,000 followers, which is like not big in that world at all. But I haven't posted a photo of myself in a, in a while, like about a year or two, I think, anyways. Um, or at least, you know, people aren't paying attention. <laughs> So I'm starting to get emails being like, hey, dude, or like, hey, man. Hey, bro. And I'm like assuming that it's, yeah, exactly, like bro and stuff like that. And I'm just assuming that, you know, that's just like a neutral term because I'll say like, hey, dude, to Lisa Carney all day long, right? But then as they continue with the conversation, I realize, oh, you think I'm a guy? And I'm just like, yeah, I'm just going to let him keep making it. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. And the reason I brought that up is I know that the advice <laughs> is, oh, you know, you just got to have a thick skin and, you know, you just got to ignore these people. But like... I'm sure there it's that's more than that. I just wanted to get your thoughts on on what you do in order for that type of stuff not to bother you. Because I know, I mean, like I said, I put stuff online and I gotten some very mean comments that I still remember like a day later or, you know, that I'm still upset. Like, I can't believe that person said that. Well, yeah, because it hurts. I mean, you're just like, I'm trying to be good here. I'm doing my best. And yeah. you're coming up here like, what have you done with your life? Like, let's do this in the parking lot. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> say that to my face <laughs> yeah yeah especially if they think you're a guy yeah right <laughs> but I mean ultimately on one side go to therapy that's a big one pay a professional just don't do it alone you just don't have to handle this stuff by yourself you know there are a lot of tools out there um, even if you're financially a little bit strapped there's like support groups like just you know get it out of your own head and talk Definitely. to somebody um, that's a big one and that nobody ever talks about, you know, everyone's just like, Oh, you just get thick skin and you just like, you know, go for a walk and go outside and like stick, go bare feet in the grass. I'm just like, Oh my God, come on. Like, <laughs> No, a hundred percent agree with that. I would recommend speaking to a therapist because I do believe in mental health, especially if you're putting yourself out there and receiving a lot more input from the world that you normally would. Um, you definitely mm -hmm. are going to need it. Yeah. Especially, I mean, so like the first time I had some work go viral, you know, I was just, I was not prepared. I was not prepared <laughs> for what that meant, you know, and this was before the algorithms were, you know, like really cutting that stuff down. And, you know, somebody comes up and they're just like, well, you know, I could have done this better. I could have this, I could have that. Yeah. And you go check out their work and they're just like, no, you couldn't, but who cares? Like, it doesn't matter. I mean, so that's on the flip side. That's also the speed check for me that I use to this day. Cause every now and then someone will put a comment and I'm like, oh shit, they're right. <laughs> It happens. It happens. 
It totally happens. You know, where it's just like, I missed something obvious. Like I recently posted a photo of uh, Nita Strauss and um, a bunch of her fans. She's a, she's a guitar player and she's got freaking a zillion followers. Anyways, someone had commented on there like, oh, the two dots above her head are distracting. And I looked at it and I was like, yeah, no, you're right. That's a hundred percent distracting. We're going to remove that for the print file. <laughs> But most of the time it comes from people who do like, you know, they haven't done anything with their life. Like the most thing that they've done is like shitty comments in a comment section. And the, uh, the biggest thing that I always remind myself is that happy people don't write shitty things in comment sections. They don't. No. Like you don't even have to wish them a bad day because they're already having one. <laughs> Their every day is a bad day. I've noticed when I do get those comments, it's never an attack. It's never like, oh, you suck, you this, you that, you did this wrong. It's always like, hey, I noticed you missed this. They mm -hmm. just call it out. They don't attack yeah. you. And usually yeah, sometimes the it's not an attack. Yeah. And usually the attacks come from people, as you said, who you click on their profile, they have no real work or, you know, you can tell that they're, yeah. ha as you said, having a bad day probably. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so I really, it is part of having a thick skin of just, you know, that is part of it. You do have to develop a thick skin. Like you can go to your therapist every single time somebody writes you a terrible comment. And if that's where you are in your mental health journey, you do that. But eventually you're going to get to the point where you're just like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> Their day is worse than mine. I don't need to carry it with me. So, Renee, I like to end the show by asking a series of lightning round questions. Uh, some of these may be very short. They can be a little longer. Feel it. free to go into a story if you like. Uh, no right, right answer. Just, you know, whatever comes to your mind. This one's probably going to be easy for you, but maybe not. Um, maybe there's more stuff we don't know. Tell us a shocking fact about yourself. Oh, um, this is my favorite one that no one ever guesses. Uh, I'm really good at like country dancing. Really? <laughs> yes, oh my everyone God. Everyone does that. Okay, well, the next I time I see it. you in person, we're going to have to figure out where to go because I want to see this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I, don't, I haven't tried since getting T-boned, but uh, I used to compete in uh, two-step, double-step, and jive, and I love it. That is yeah. incredible. I am seriously the shocked. goth girl. <laughs> Um, the, the next question is, when was the last time you felt proud of yourself? Uh, this is going to be like a weird answer, but I started doing trauma therapy last year. Oh, wow. I, yeah. I know, it and, feels uh, weird to say, but congratulations. <laughs> yeah, 100%. It's like, it's so helpful. and But it's so hard. It's so hard to start. Yeah. You know, and I started going because of the brain injuries and I started, I discovered that there was a concussion clinic here in Edmonton. Oh, wow. And I was just like, what? We finally have a concussion clinic. Let's do this. And That's I just amazing. registered right away. Like basically I was in contortion class. I was doing contortion training. And uh, before the class was over, I had already found it, booked an appointment. Like I was, you know, same thing as you We're just like, there is a task. We are doing the thing until the thing is done. Go. And uh, when I was in there, she, she, you know, she was telling me like, you know, well, you probably should like see a trauma therapist. And I was like, oh, well, you know, like whatever. And then I saw a different therapist and she, um, and he was like, you should probably see a trauma therapist. And I was like, all right, two people said it, let's book it, let's do it. And I started and uh, yeah, what an experience, what a journey. And it'll be a while yet before it's done, but it's a thing when you finally take the step, the first step of just being like, okay, I am not being that like this, the way that I've lived my life and the, you know, the, the responses that I have, I'm just not doing that anymore. And I'm going to start this process. So yeah, that I think is, that is something you should definitely be proud thing. of. So yeah. And congrats yeah. again, seriously. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> the next question is what is the best compliment you have ever received? That is a good question. I think my favorite compliment I get is whenever I photograph somebody who is, um, from a marginalized group, mm how safe they feel with me. Um, you know, I photograph a lot of, you know, drag and transgender and, and other things like that. And the one comment that I get a lot is, you know, thank you so much for making me feel safe. Thank you so much for making me feel heard. And that always feels so good because I mean, these people are often, they're not heard and they're not seen and they don't feel safe, you know? And even if while we're shooting, if I notice like, oh, they're not really feeling this, I'll just ask them like, Hey, what do you think about this? You know, you seem like a little bit off, like you want to change it up a little bit. And I'm like, actually, yeah, that'd be great. And I'm like, let's do it. They're like, oh, you don't have to, you don't want to, like, you're not feeling this? I'm like, I'm not doing that. Let's go. <laughs> let's change it up. <laughs> have you had an I made it moment? Ah, when I got in Heavy Metal Magazine. What? Tell me about that. Yeah, that was so cool. I mean, I grew up reading Heavy Metal Magazine, you know, from like friends, you know, like the older siblings and stuff like that. And just like, that's where I discovered so many of the painters that I loved you know, without knowing Frazetta's name, you know, Louis Royo, Boris Vallejo, all those, you know, like the 
standard people of, uh, you know, art at the time. And, you know, I was just like, oh man, it'd be really cool to get in heavy metal magazine. Like, that'd be really fun. And a friend of mine had done some work with heavy metal and they were just like, well, here's their email. And I was like, <laughs> cool, let's do it. <laughs> so I sent them an email and they were just like, oh, we're not really right now, but like, you know, thanks for sending over your portfolio. We'll keep in touch. You know, and so six months later, just like pop him an email being like, hey guys, how's it going? Just like a little mouse <laughs> walking into this den feeling totally unworthy. You know, oh, not right now. You know, we don't really have anything. And like, okay, cool, cool, cool. You know, <laughs> six months later, like, hey guys, how's it going? <laughs> hopefully I'm not annoying you, but hopefully you don't forget about me. You know, six months later after that, I get an email being like, hey, we got a spot open. Are you still interested? It's like, wow. But it took yes. it took perseverance. You kept trying. It's not like you. Yeah, but like I tried to not be annoying about it, because that's also a good way to get blacklisted. One hundred percent. You have to be tactful. To no, no doubt about it. But mm -hmm. you, you have yeah, to try. But, oh yeah, that was so cool. I mean, I would love to get into heavy metal magazine. I don't even know who's working there anymore. I mean, it's all it got sold since then. But yeah, that was pretty cool to see my name on the cover mm -hmm. of heavy metal. I have it um, in my pile of magazines there. But that's just one that I never thought I would have. Yeah. What would you like to be remembered for? What mark do you want to leave in the world? I'm okay if I'm not remembered. That's the thing that's like, I'm good with that. There's so much to pay attention to that I think the best part about most of us is that we do get to fade into nothing, right? Like the things that we do in life, our mistakes, the things that we screw up, whatever, they actually just don't matter in the big picture. And we're very lucky because of that. We're going to have to leave this for another show, but I 100% agree with you. I, I think that in a long <laughs> enough timeline, nothing matters. And that actually mm -hmm. makes me feel better when something's not going the way that I want or, you know, something quote unquote bad happens. Yeah. I think, you know what? In like 200 years, like nobody's going to remember this. In 50 like, years. I'll be, I'll be lucky if anyone remembers my name in 20 and I'm good with that. <laughs> right. Same. Like, I think I used to want to, you know, when I was younger, you know, wanted to be remembered for something. You know, and like I wanted to, you know, be the next, you know, I obviously lacked the skills to be the next Michelangelo. That's for sure. Um, I never had those kind of delusions. But, you know, I really wanted to to have some kind of impact on someone in some way. And I think that inevitably that's going to happen anyways, no matter who you are in life. You're going to have you're going to be somebody's villain and you're going to be somebody's hero planned or not. And I think I just as I've gotten older, I've just started to accept that, like, it's totally cool um, that I'm someone's villain and I'm someone's hero and I'm a whole bunch of people's nobodies. And that's, that's good with me. I think that's a healthy way of looking at things, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, Renee, thank you so much for joining me today, uh, for being today's creator. But, you know, thank you so much for having me on. I'm so excited to see what everyone else, because you have really thoughtful questions. So I'm very curious to see how and what you've asked other people and how they answer.